time for member statements. Member statements. I recognize the member for Scarborough Agincourt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was delighted to participate in a number of events to celebrate Black History Month and pay tribute to the contribution of black community in Canada and to applaud their impressive achievements. This year's theme was called Black Excellence, a heritage to celebrate, a future to build, end of quote. We are proud of the black community and their essential role in raising Canada's global stature to such high standards. The impact of Canada's black community in education, medicine, art, culture, public service, economic development, politics, human rights, and so many other fields are too immense to mention here. Their sacrifices made Canada a beacon of democracy and human rights and paved the way for other persecuted people from all over the world to find refuge in Canada and get a new lease on life. We are grateful for your inspiring vision and influence. In addition to joining my Scarborough colleagues and organizing our own celebration in Scarborough, I attended plum the Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Union and International Union of Painters and Allied Traders celebrations at Queen's Park. I also attended events at the Taibu Community Health Center, Tropicana Community Services, and Afro Global Television. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Member statements. I recognize the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. Under this Conservative government, Ontario's justice system is in shambles. Everywhere access to justice is denied routinely. Ontario courts rank dead last in case backlogs and wait times nationwide. The Conservatives play politics with justice, appointing unqualified cronies, including a gun lobbyist, to select their next round of judges. Delays and denials of justice ruin lives. Criminals walk free and the innocents suffer behind bars. This isn't just about funding, it's about setting priorities. The government's budget ignores the crisis in our courts. This government released its budget two days ago. I scoured the budget. I was looking for funding in our courts, and it was not there. Not once did it mention bail pre-detention or court backlogs. It's easy for Ontarian su survivors to give up and when their own government has given up on them. Today in the chamber sits two extraordinary women, Kate Alexander and Emily Agar, who have individually endured violent crimes against them only to have their cases tossed out because of court delays. Devastated, they watch their, their accused walk free and back into the community. Kate and Emily are here to demand tangible solutions, starting with the budget, not hollow assurances from the Premier and the Attorney General. We must thank Kate and Emily for their incredible strength, for coming here today, and for sharing their painful stories yet once again in hopes that this government will actually come up with the solutions and fix our broken courts. Member statements. I recognize the member for Mississauga Malton. <clears throat> Speaker, the number one issue that I hear from the resident of Mississauga Malton is affordability. With increase in inflation, mortgage interest rate, economic uncertainty, it is resulting in stress to the residents. And then on April 1st, the upcoming 23% increase in the carbon tax by the federal liberals intensifies this burden, creating a vicious cycle of rising costs that affects every aspect of daily life. Increased gas prices lead to higher costs for everything, from groceries to borrowing, resulting in inflation that further strains household budgets. While Ontario is diligently working towards 2030 greenhouse gas reduction targets with emissions already above 26.1% declining since 2005. Initiatives like green steel projects exemplify our commitment to sustainable practices. This project alone will mitigate millions of tons of carbon dioxide emission annually, equivalent to removing almost over 1 million cars from the roads. Therefore, 
Speaker, it is imperative that all MPPs send a clear message to their MPs asking them to stand with their resident and let's prioritize affordability and sustainability without further burdening hardworking families. Tell federal government to consider its approach and scrap the burdensome carbon tax now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Yes. Member statements. The Thank member for Linder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Universities and colleges are incredibly important institutions. Mm -hmm. They are primary sites of research, and they are where the young and not so young go to learn critical thinking and specific subject and occupational knowledge. Tragically, Post-secondary education in Ontario has been underfunded for the last 20 years at 43 per cent less than the national average. Even with the injection of $1.3 billion divided over three years amongst our 60 public post-secondary institutions, Ontario will still be dead last. To be clear, no one wants to see tuition increased. Domestic tuition is far too high, and making up the difference by charging international students exorbitant fees has been, frankly, shameful. Far too many students, domestic and international, have to take on part-time jobs just to survive when they should be able to focus their time and energy on learning. On the faculty side, class sizes keep going up, as do the number of faculty on short-term, low-wage contracts who do not have the time to support students outside the classroom. Students and faculty are being squeezed on all sides, and the effects are showing up in mental health crises. The Ford Conservatives are undermining all our futures. Research cannot flourish, and students cannot reach their full potential when our colleges and universities are collapsing. We can and must do better. Member statements. The member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. Speaker, a few weeks ago, I had the chance to attend a funding announcement at Bancroft Fitness. This $71,700 capital grant from the Minister of Tourism, and, uh, Tourism, Culture and Sport through the Trillium Fund allowed them to upgrade their HVAC system to ensure a safe exercise environment and allow more comfortable exercise temperatures for their brand new hydrotherapy pool. Excellent. Bancroft Fitness is a unique environment. It operates as a not-for-profit, small-town-style gym. Residents of Bancroft and the surrounding area can join the gym for a minimal membership fee, which includes typical group classes like yoga, meditation, high- and low-impact fitness, and more. But, Speaker, what's truly unique about this facility is the connection between health and fitness. Championed by Dr. Carolyn Brown over 20 years ago, she had a patient that was suffering from soft tissue pain after a car accident, and she realized that she couldn't use medicine to help that patient. So she partnered with a kinesiologist, Angela Carrera, to create a new fitness center. Bancroft Fitness promotes healthy fitness habits for individuals of all needs and all activity levels in direct partnership with the Bancroft Community Family Health Team. This is the first fitness facility in Ontario that partners directly with an Ontario family health team. They provide programs like cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation, where they provide exercise, education, and counseling. This is a healthcare innovation. So I want to express my congratulations to Bancroft Fitness on the improvements to your facility and my thanks to the Ministry and the Ontario Trillium Fund for their support. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for Parkdale, High Park. I rise today with great concern over the inaction and provincial defunding of urgently needed supervised consumption services in Ontario. This will result in increased overdose deaths, undue burden on emergency response services, and will deny the rights of access to essential health care interventions and wraparound supports for people dealing with addiction. In 2018, when this Conservative government came to power, they arbitrarily capped funding to only 21 sites. 
place. Six years later, despite overwhelming need and local support, only 17 sites have been approved and funded. Now even these handful of sites are under imminent threat of closure due to lack of funding. Communities across this province are declaring states of emergencies over this crisis. Sites are operating through the sacrifices of burnt-out frontline workers, keeping doors open through piecemeal donations. This is for basic life-saving services. An estimated 3,644 drug-related deaths just last year in Ontario, and over 20,000 deaths under this government's watch. The Conservative government is literally abandoning the most vulnerable and marginalized people in our province. The overdose crisis is impacting many in my community of Parkdale High Park and people across Toronto. But you know what, Speaker? It's worse in northern Ontario, in southwestern Ontario. It's smaller cities that are hardest hit by this crisis, many communities that Conservative MPPs represent. These are preventable deaths. The government must stop ignoring this crisis. It's not going to go away unless you do something about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements. <clears throat> the member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. Colleagues, I want to update you this morning on the ongoing exciting developments in the world of medical isotopes. Wow. As members know, for over half a century, Canada has been a world leader in the development, production and use of life-saving medical isotopes in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer, while also tackling some of the greatest health sciences challenge. challenges, including equipment and PPE sterilization, fighting the Zika virus, and pharmaceutical advancements. In 2023, the Canadian Nuclear Isotopes Council launched Isotopes for Hope, Canadian leadership now more than ever, with the goal of doubling Canadian production of isotopes by 2030. The world needs more Canada is core to the CNIC's message, as they have unique capabilities, people and infrastructure for our Canadian isotope ecosystem. They recently launched the first Isotopes for Hope podcast series to share perspectives from Canadians who are inspiring leaders, turning this vision into a reality and delivering important progress to people around the world who are counting on Canada as a global isotope superpower. Last week, this important message was brought directly to Queen's Park at an excellent medical isotopes reception. Members from Kitchener, South Hespeler, and in Mississauga Centre have been very active in this exciting work and were there to share their message. This ongoing work is absolutely uh, excellent for Ontario, and we look forward to ongoing leadership and collaboration right here in Ontario to, to, to promote medical isotopes. Thank you, Speaker. Well said. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Kanata, Carleton. Thank you, Speaker. Based on the overwhelming scientific consensus and lived experience, I know that climate change is real, and I believe it is our responsibility to act. Otherwise, it will be our children and our grandchildren who will be dealing with disaster after disaster. Speaker, it is a shame to see another budget that does nothing about the climate. This government loves to point fingers, but refuses to lift a finger to do something themselves. The only climate measure they've taken, the cancelling of cap and trade, has been a disaster. It cost the government $3 billion in penalties, and it shifted the cost of carbon from corporate polluters to the people of Ontario an extra $300 a year. This government doesn't care about the climate, and they don't care about affordability. What will it take to have this government take the threat to the health, safety, and security of Ontarians seriously? This recent budget has done nothing to help Ontario families with the mounting crises in affordability, health care, housing, or the climate. This government does nothing but point fingers, write letters, and blame others so they can continue to reward wealthy, connected corporate insiders at the expense of everyone else. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Oakville. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. April 1st, as we all know, is April Fool's Day. But you know what is not funny? On April 1st, the residents of Oakville, along with the rest of the province, will wake up to life being more expensive and more unaffordable. Shame. My constituents in Oakville have reached out to me concerned with the rising cost of living, especially the rising federal carbon tax. Just last week, I had residents come up to me at a local grocery store and mention how much the carbon tax hurts them. They are feeling the extra costs for basic activities such as driving their kids to soccer practice. At the Oakville Meals on Wheels grant recognition program event I was at a week ago, residents were really appreciative of the funding they received, but very upset and worried by the rising tax hike coming on April 1st. For those volunteers, the hike for gas makes each delivery to vulnerable people that much more expensive. I am proud that our government, under the leadership of our finance minister and Premier Ford, are supporting families and businesses by proposing to extend the gas and fuel tax cuts until December 31, 2024. We know every dollar helps, and this gas tax is another way to help keep the costs for Ontarians down. But that's not all. Renewal on license plate renewal fees and stickers that save vehicle owners $3.3 billion. And we launched the One Fair program, which will save commuters in Oakville $1,600 per year. As April 1st is around the corner, we continue to call on the federal government to scrap the tax. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements, the member for Windsor to come see. Hey! Speaker, and I was truly proud to see that Windsor and Tecumseh were once again front and center in our government's affordability-focused budget. Here, here. As this House is aware, in 2017, the then Liberal government announced planning funding for a new regional acute care hospital would be stopped in its tracks uh, wow. with the 2018 budget. So the contrast couldn't be clearer. Why Premier Ford committed to seeing the Windsor Essex Regional Acute Care Hospital, and this budget sets out the hospital procurement for 2025. This budget, <laughs> this budget also builds a new Banwell ECRO interchange right at the boundary of Windsor and Tecumseh, a project that successive governments of all stripes outright ignored for 40 years until this government. This budget also develops the future Lowe's on Parkway 401 interchange, supports thousands of new jobs at Nexstar and Bobeek, invests in local broadband, grows access to primary health care and long-term care, and says yes to our new local schools, including the Beacon Heights Public School and Eastview Horizon Public School. Oh, wow. These investments make our region stronger than ever. And I want to say thank you to Premier Ford and the Ontario government for doing the heavy lifting for Windsor-Essex that just never happened under NDP representation and Liberal governments. And I encourage all of my Windsor colleagues to support these great investments in the budget. Here, here. Thank you very much. That concludes our member's statements for this morning.